We need to revisit the topic of sebaceous hyperplasia. It's been, I want to say, six years since I did a video on this topic, and I know so many of y'all struggle with these pesky little bumps, so we really need to add to the conversation. I know you have so many questions. What can be done to prevent these from coming back? Maybe you've already invested time, money, energy, in having them removed only to get more down the road. We are going to do a deep dive into why it is you make these little bumps and what can be done about them. Well, in order to understand why you are developing sebaceous hyperplasia in the first place, those little bumps, you need to understand a little bit about your sebaceous oil glands. The sebaceous oil glands, they exist for the most part in association with a hair follicle. Now on your face, that is what you see as a pore. The actual number of sebaceous glands that you have, it remains constant throughout your entire lifetime for the most part. However, the activity of those those glands and the size of them varies with age and with hormones. Sebaceous glands contain cells called sebocytes that go through a process of maturation. And once they become fully matured, they are defined by being sort of stuffed with lipid. They then disintegrate into the center, if you will, of your oil gland so that that oil can be released out onto the surface of your skin. This whole maturation differentiation process is influenced by androgen hormones. Once you hit puberty and you begin to have an increase in androgen hormones, the size and activity of the sebaceous glands starts to increase. Once you get into your 30s, androgen hormones, they may start to dwindle normally with age and so that activity can naturally decline. As androgen levels decrease with age, the maturation process of those sebocytes, the key cell type in the oil gland, starts to slow down as it loses some of the influence of the androgen hormones. And as it slows down, those little immature sebocytes, they kind of get stuck. And that is what leads to sebaceous hyperplasia. If you actually look at the bump of sebaceous hyperplasia under the microscope, you don't see these big sebocytes full of oil. Sebaceous hyperplasia, a bump of sebaceous hyperplasia, you'll notice it's not super oily. It's not pumping out a lot of sebum. Sometimes, yes, you can extract a small amount of oily material. They don't really have have that usual hormonal influence helping guide them to become fully mature, differentiated, functional sebocytes, whose ultimate fate is to disintegrate, releasing their oily material. But when that gets backed up, well, you kind of get this enlarged oil gland. That's what you see with your eyes as sebaceous hyperplasia. So the reason you form these, for the most part, is related to age-related decline in androgen hormones. Now, to a certain extent, ultraviolet radiation also plays a role because damaging rays, they disrupt and damage DNA and skin cells. And so that can mess up the normal turnover processes, making you more predisposed to these. But that being said, they can appear in sun protected skin. So it's certainly not the only factor, but it definitely plays a role. The other thing that might influence one's tendency to develop these is if you take the medication cyclosporin. This is a medication given to patients who have organ transplants oftentimes to suppress their immune system so they don't reject the organ. We also use this medication a fair amount in dermatology to treat a variety of things like psoriasis, for example. And sometimes patients on this medication can get sebaceous hyperplasia kind of out of nowhere. And it's thought maybe to do with the fact that cyclosporin somehow localizes within the oil gland and has some influence on the maturation process leading to this uh, formation of sebaceous hyperplasia. What to do about sebaceous hyperplasia? Well, the first thing you need to understand is these are not life-threatening. They are not dangerous. They are not a cancer. They don't turn into a cancer. They don't go away on their own, but they're not dangerous, meaning an obvious option of what to do about them is to do nothing. That is an option here. For some people, that is not an option because they're bothered by the way that they look. But for other people, they're like, what are these? Should they come off? Um, they're sebaceous hyperplasia. They certainly do not have to come off. But for those of you who are like, yeah, I'm here because I want to know how to get rid of them, what to do to keep them from coming back. Well, what we can do to get rid of them is going to involve methodologies, treatment approaches that largely are destructive. And there are a number of ways in which we can destroy these little bumps and get them to go away. Now, 
any one procedure has its risks, its benefits. For the most part, the main risks with all of these types of procedures are scarring and dispigmentation. If the little bump is not destroyed in total, there is a high risk that that individual bump will come back. Photodynamic therapy is a destructive option for clearing out several of these in kind of one fell swoop and that it involves using a photosensitizing medication and visible light to create a reaction in the skin that helps to clear these up. Then there's good old fashioned liquid nitrogen, cryotherapy. Your dermatologist can take liquid nitrogen and repeat freeze thaw cycles to selectively destroy those abnormal cells constituting that bump and make it go away. Another tool that basically does the same thing but in a different way is a treatment called electrodesiccation. Who here has watched my video on TCA cross for pitted acne scars? You're like, I don't have pitted acne scars. Why would I have watched that? Well, um, TCA, trichloroacetic acid. It's a very inexpensive reagent that actually is quite useful in treating many different things, including sebaceous hyperplasia. So that's an option, trichloroacetic acid for destruction. Then there are all the fancy lasers. CO2 laser, for example, can destroy these. If all else fails, your dermatologist can just cut these little bumps out. Again, risks include scarring, dispigmentation. That may be taking some of the color away from your skin or leaving behind a dark mark. Which of these is best? There really is no single best one. The one that's the best kind of depends on a variety of factors in terms of balancing likelihood of scarring, hyperpigmentation, hypopigmentation, and also what is available from your dermatologist. They may not have, for example, CO2 laser readily available, or maybe it's just cost prohibitive. Like I said, some of these other things, equally effective, much less expensive, to have around and to utilize. Oral isotretinoin, commonly referred to as Accutane, is a retinoid that you take by mouth. People who take isotretinoin who have sebaceous hyperplasia, in many cases, the sebaceous hyperplasia will go away. Unfortunately, for a lot of people, not everyone, but for a lot of people, when they stop the isotretinoin, the sebaceous hyperplasia comes right back. But some people can actually get them to go away and stay away even when they come off of the isotretinoin. So that's something to think about if you have, especially if you have a lot of them and you are really, really bothered by them and to treat all of them with one of the destructive methodologies, you start running into maybe more of a risk of, you know, scarring, hyperpigmentation, and you want to avoid that and you want to consider this, it's something to bring up with your dermatologist. You guys know from my isotretinoin videos, you're like, no, we don't. We don't have acne. We're here for the sebaceous hyperplasia talk. Why would you assume we watched a video about acne? We don't have acne. We're here for sebaceous hyperplasia. Okay. Isotretinoin it's a medication used to treat acne. It's a retinoid. Um, it's a pill that you take. While it's for acne, we also use it to treat a variety of other things. It does have side effects for which you need to be monitored for. It's not gonna be right for everyone. For the most part, the most common one is skin dryness and dry eyes, dry mucous membranes. That's almost a guarantee actually and kind of a sign that you are actually taking it. Generally though, with isotretinoin, it takes about two to six weeks of being on it for the bumps to clear up. So those are sort of the available treatments for this. Is there anything that can be done to prevent them from coming back? There's no established guaranteed treatment, remedy, skincare routine that will prevent you from getting more of these. However, I would say the thing that makes the most sense and that a lot of people anecdotally report, hey, I don't seem to be getting as many ever since I started using this, and it makes sense. And if you're not irritated by it, it's it can be worth a try and that is a topical retinoid and you're like oh god it was a topical retinoid the solution for all of skin problems many problems topical retinoids can address and this is one in which it might okay i say might because truthfully we don't have studies really looking at topical retinoids for prevention of recurrences of sebaceous hyperplasia at least rigorous studies but a lot of patients do find that they do see a decrease in the number of them mechanistically it makes sense because topical retinoids help with cell differentiation, maturation, help to get those processes going along at a more normal, reasonable rate. Remember, the root cause of the sebaceous hyperplasia is that those sebacytes that make up the sebaceous gland 
they get a little backed up. They get a little slow as androgens decline. And so you get all these little baby sebacytes clumped together in there and it gets too full. And that's why you get sebaceous hyperplasia. So theoretically, a retinoid might actually help to get those things to get back on track, to get those little baby cells back on track. It's, it's theoretical. And yes, again, people do report anecdotally a reduction, but it hasn't been like rigorously substantiated. So of course, there's topical tazeratine, topical tretinoin, topical triferritine. And you know, you, here in the US, you can buy adapalene over the counter as a reasonable option to try. How do you know if what you have on your face is sebaceous hyperplasia? That's a good question. Question. Now they look like little yellow, white to skin colored bumps. Oftentimes they kind of have this little divot in the center. We call that a central del. And they can have an overlying, what we call a telangiectasia, meaning an obvious blood vessel, especially noticeable if you look at it like under a handheld dermatoscope, you can see them, but sometimes it's more obvious to the naked eye as well. That being said, it is important to show these to your dermatologist because let me tell you, there are so many face bumps, so many. And and some of them look very similar, like very, very, very similar. If you want to know what dermatology residency is like, it's basically like drills of, can you tell what bump this is? Um, that's not all it is, but we do a lot of drills like that. Like it's pattern recognition. So it's not, it's not straightforward, it's not easy. And here's the thing, um, certain skin cancers, namely basal cell carcinoma, can look very similar to sebaceous hyperplasia. So you wanna make sure that what you have is actually sebaceous hyperplasia. The best way to know that and to be sure, which is important, is to see a board certified dermatologist and bring it to their attention. Again, if confirmed, these are not life-threatening. They don't you know, lead to local destruction. They don't end up being permanently disfiguring in terms of, you know, causing some sort of deformity on your face. Cosmetically, they may bother you, okay? But the only reason to treat them is if they bother you for cosmetic reasons. They don't cause pain for people, physical pain. They don't, um, yeah, they, they, you don't have to treat them. And that's important to, to remember because a lot of people, um, you know, assume that doctors just throw medications at everything, but not treating certain things is an option. All right, guys, that's a wrap up with regards to sebaceous hyperplasia. I've had this on my list for a long time as a refresh video because I don't think I talked about a lot of these things in my last sebaceous hyperplasia video years ago. Anyways, guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.